All right, we might make might make a start. So, firstly, welcome everyone to the November Griffith de Kock webinar. Uh, obviously, spring carnival time, uh, but lots happening overseas. So, with Griffith de Kock being uh, obviously bigger than just what we have here, Mike, uh, you're the main man overseas and all around the world. Uh, welcome along. Thanks very much, Corey. Nice to be um, on your webinar with you guys. And I guess uh, spring racing has begun in South Africa as well as here. Yes. Uh, so if you just wanted to fill us in in what's happening abroad, both in South Africa and also in Dubai, I know that their season started. Yeah, Corey, um, you know, we have spring season. Yeah, we have sort of probably about a month or six weeks yeah, in, in Gauteng in Johannesburg. And then uh, the show really moves to Cape Town sort of mid to late November, January, uh, December, January, and a little bit of February. Um, that's obviously Cape Town, for those who don't know, it's quite a journey down. It's about, it's about a 16 to 18 hour van drive, uh, about a two hour flight. Um, most of your uh, group ones and that kind of thing will start, start up there. We have the Summer Cup here at the end of November, which is a big handicap of, a, of a 10 furlongs. Um, that'll be our biggest. Um, and uh, then the show moves to Cape Town. Uh, Dubai, obviously, the carnival starts January. And it's all just built up now. It's gathering the horses, getting them in, getting the team going. Um, we, you know, so we're sort of in a rebuilding stage there as well. Uh, you know, Dubai sort of over the last two, three years has sort of collapsed with COVID and the uh, export out of South Africa. So we're looking to get that going. And, Go all right this year, and then hopefully 2022, 2023, um, you'll be up to what we were. Yep. And Robbie, I'll, I'll cut to you. Obviously, um, it was Griffith Racing, but now it's been a year on that it's been Griffith to Cock Racing. How exciting is it both to have Matthew here, but also to links all across the world with Mike? Oh, it's very exciting. And as uh, Mike just touched on then, is to ramp up, you know, as Mike's saying about ramping up Dubai in 22-23 and Matt and I are hoping that some of the horses in the yard will be suitable to um, join into the uh, action in Dubai when the time is right. So, but, you know, with COVID changing all the, the way things are done around the world, it's been hard to do that. And with our team being so young, they need to develop and, uh, and fit into that, uh, into that cycle as well. Yeah, and Matt, obviously you did, did a lot over in Dubai. So is it a strange feeling being on this side of the world while while the carnival's kicking off, I guess, in, in different places around the world and you're not there with your dad at the moment? But how, how's that sort of feeling being down here while all of that's happening? Yeah, it's been a, it's been a different feeling because I've uh, set new roots here in Australia and, uh, you know, trying new things and, and trying to achieve new goals and, hopefully opening new doors just to make the, uh, the De Kock brand and the Griffiths brand bigger and better. So um, hopefully in the next two to three years, it'll just all come together uh, harmoniously at once and we can be very uh, a very exciting international brand, you know? Yeah, and Mike, we'll, we'll touch on a really exciting three-year-old filly that you've got at the moment, Desert Miracle. Um, what are your plans with her? Because uh, she looks pretty pretty special she is very really special you know um we bought the the mother in goffs in in ireland um uh, many well, i'm trying to think that probably 10 12 years ago she was quite a quite a good filly one about seven times um top class group two filly uh group one place if i remember correctly um so good international female line and obviously the size dynasty is fort wood as uh, his dynasty is a as a cult that Mary bred, so um, he's got quite. She has got quite an international pedigree, and I know with interest actually, a lot of Australian buyers and buying in the north now as well, which can only, you know, strengthen your 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 bloodline down there. But she's got a true international pedigree, and she's a and she's a proper international horse. You know, I mean, I wish it was just so easy as to put her on a plane and come to Australia and run in the carnival there, but it isn't. But she's uh, she's international standard, that's for sure. Yeah. And you you mentioned 
Australians buying abroad and we obviously bought abroad recently but I've also been following the horse in training sales and you bought uh, some horses there and tell us about the plans for, for those horses. Yeah, well, you know, ultimately, um, uh, the, obviously, the two of them we bought are in Dubai. Um, one of them is a non-carnival horse. The other one is just short. I think he's rated 89, so he's going to have to up his game. But should he up his game through the carnival there and do well, then obviously the intention is to send him down to to um, to Australia, which is um, a horse called Magical Land. I think he's by Frankel. Um, but... Um, you know, it, it seems those those imports do quite well, especially over a bit of a trip in Australia. So, um, we, you know, we'd like to, to tap into that and try and strengthen uh, Robbie and Matt uh, in that fashion as well with a few Northern Hemisphere horses. And we bought one from start on the recent sale, which is, he actually came highly recommended to us. He's only raced a couple of times. He's by Dubawi. Um, he'll get out to... Um, to the carnival to Dubai, and then obviously if he if he ups his game, then down to Australia as well. So look, it's something we used to do quite a lot of in years gone by. But you know, obviously with with uh, the world changing and uh, and um, export protocols being so arduous out of South Africa, we sort of dropped the ball on that one a little bit. But we want to get that thing, that that sort of thing going again. You know, buying up horses in training and, and uh, strengthening both Dubai and then Australia afterwards. Yep. And Robbie, I guess if we could fast forward a couple of years, you know, the dream we've talked about at the stable almost daily about, you know, where we'll be in a couple of years time. And it must be an exciting thing, even sitting here and listening to Mike talk about top quality horses being sent down. Um, and, and those horses, for, for those that don't know, are literally in that, that bracket of the horses that are running in our Melbourne Cups and things like that in this past week. So um, certainly some good horses coming our way as well as our young ones. Well, absolutely, Corey. I mean, you know, these sort of plans don't happen overnight. You know, they, take, they take two to three years in the planning, you know, to, for it to all come to fruition. And that's, that's, that's a quick turnaround, you know, so... To buy young horses and to buy, uh, you know, European horses and the horses that Mike's talking about by the time they develop and go through the process of protocols in different countries and, you know, lift their ratings and all the things that you have to do to, to develop them into what you want them to be. It takes a little while, but once you do that, then all of a sudden these fantastic uh, carnivals that we're having this week and all the, all the different carnivals around the world, whether it be Dubai or, or whichever carnival you're targeting, uh, will certainly give our owners and ourselves so much excitement. Yeah, and, and Matt, uh, you, you mentioned earlier this week a horse uh, that was with your dad, Catch-22, is en route to Australia. Can you, can you could tell me a little bit about that horse? Yeah, he wasn't actually um, trained by my dad in South Africa, but he's owned by one of our clients, Arun and Warren uh, Ribbon, who have supported us a lot of the yearling sales this year. And they have a uh, burning desire to, to come and compete in Australia. And uh, this horse, Catch-22, is a, a winner of multiple features in South Africa and being Group 1 placed on numerous occasions. He's a, he's a very talented young horse and he's running amongst a good group, a good crop of South African horses right now. And uh, they've put him on the plane. I think he's en route. He might be in Mauritius at the moment. Um, but he's en route to hopefully come to Australia if, if all things go well. Yeah, and it's quite hard to, to bring them down here from South Africa. So, Mike, if you just wanted to touch on that export uh, and, and what are the ch challenges in bringing them here? Yeah, I know that, that's quite a long process, especially to Australia, because... After Mauritius, which is a three-month deal um, where they don't really exercise that much, um, they have to spend, for some reason, uh, six months in Europe before they can go down to Australia. Now, I mean, I've never in my life ever heard of horses having to have so much quarantine, albeit they're not going to be in quarantine in Europe. It's a residency. Um, what the exact reason for that is, I don't know. It's something the Australian government decided two or three years ago uh, to do. So he'll get out of Mauritius in December um, and then he'll be on to, to the UK. Uh, if we decide to go for the carnival with him, which is a long shot at this stage because I don't think it'll do him justice in terms of fitness and um, 
So we we'll probably leave him in Europe, but we'll, we'll see how he travels out of Mauritius and then ship him down when he's eligible in six months, which will be probably June. Maybe mm -hmm. give him a run in Europe so he'll get down there fit. But it'll be interesting to see, to try and marry the uh, South African form to the Australian form. Um, you had one down there, Yulong Prince won a group one. And, you know, he was a group one winner. Yeah, so there is a little bit of a line of form, especially, I think, in with horses over the trip, you know, 2,000, 1,800, that kind of thing. Your sprinter miles, they seem to be um, really special. Yeah. But and I think, you know, we produce the odd one over ground that'll, that'll hold his own. Yeah. Speaking of horses over a, a trip, Matt, um, we actually have a couple going around on Thursday on Oaks Day in the Oaks. So two runners. There's 11 in the race. We've got two of them. That's yeah, I know. It's, very, it's, it's a very exciting race for us, Corey, um, to have two runners in the Oaks. Uh, Tis My Bay ran on Saturday uh, in the Wakeville, and she ran a fantastic race, and she looks like she's set up well to, to go very good um, in the Oaks. And then going to dance a lot. She qualified for the Oaks back in um, July. She probably hasn't had the best uh, preparation, a couple of excuses, but um, we're hoping that she can turn it around and come back to her best. But it's nice to have um, two key runners in, in such a big race. Yeah, and Robbie, at such a young stage, you know, it, for the stable, not just Thursday, but if you looked at Derby Day, which is maybe, the, I think, the biggest day's racing in Australian sport, uh, we had three runners. We had one group three placed in Daily Bugle. And then we had two fantastic runs by Tismai Bay and King Magnus. The King was unbelievable and almost pinched that group one. So it must be pretty exciting that we're in our infancy and having runners on those days. Oh, it was a special day. Um, King Magnus could have very easily have won. It was one of those blanket finishes where you could replay that race many times and get a different result every time. And Matt and I watching the race were really desperately hoping that he didn't go around Satori um, coming to the corner because we, we knew he wouldn't run a mile. And, um, you know, when you get beat a sort of half a length and you, you wonder whether little fractions like that, if it doesn't happen, you might be the winner. But that's racing. That's handicap racing. And But we're very proud of the horse. He, he was terrific. And um, as I said, you know, there was a blanket finish and, you replay those races and you get different results. But he was in the he was in the mix and he hit the front and gave us a big thrill in a two million dollar Group One race. And uh, just goes to show that uh, he's he's got one in him. He just needs the the, the breaks on the right day. But uh, we might better win our hometown cup in two weeks' time, which would be good at Cranbourne. It's worth half a million dollars, so we'll be very happy with that. Yeah, and it's probably understating the training performance. He he, if people remember back, he actually didn't. Get come out of the barriers in his first run in this prep. Yeah, he doesn't. Uh, he's not fond of Lewis German. He uh, he tried to buck with him and uh, kicked off the uh, campaign as a seventy odd raider, and he's worked his way up to a ninety six raider and run at the Group One level. So he's done a very good job, and uh, I think it's credit to the team uh, and the stable to uh, to take him from a restricted grade horse to the to Group One. So yeah, no, it's been been a very uh, successful uh, campaign for his owners and the, and the stable. Yeah, and for everyone following, feel welcome just in the Q&A function to put in any questions. I'll make sure that we get through as many questions as we can. Uh, I'll come back to you now, Mike. With the Melbourne Cup tomorrow, uh, if you could tell us your experiences with Gray, Gray's Inn, who ran in the Cox Plate and the Melbourne Cup. Yeah, he, um, he started off quite well there because I think he ran in the Yolumba as well. But then he started losing weight. You know, it was, it, it, again, it wasn't easy because I had to send him uh, to Australia via Singapore. So there were massive climatic changes and whatever. But look, as far as the horse goes, he didn't perform that great. But as far as the experience goes, it was unbelievable. Um, uh, you know, it was, it was almost jaw-dropping the, the interest from public punters, people, uh, in your racing there is, is unbelievable. It was a wonderful experience. It's an experience I definitely would love to do again and recommend it to anybody, you know. Um, that, that, that week there, that carnival week is, is, is really something special, that is for sure. Yeah. And Matt, how was it to have the, have the crowd back? 
It was very good, Corey, although limited. Um, it was still very good to see some of the, the owners and see the joy on their faces at the racetrack. We've missed that, that experience. You know, I've, I've been here for two years now and, and haven't really experienced a proper Melbourne, Melbourne Cup carnival. So it's just a little taste. Um, and hopefully it's just going to get better and better. Yeah. And the, the next one, and I know that you're absolutely flying in South Africa at the moment, Mike, with seven winners last week, I think it was, and it's, that's probably higher now. I know that you had a couple of winners I backed on the weekend, uh, thanks to Matt. Um, but Matt said to ask when we can expect to see you down here now the restrictions are easing. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much hoping to, to come there in, in February. I, I definitely want to attend sales and, uh, and, 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 and try and get a few more horses. Um, I think Diane will come in January. Um, you know, we're all pretty excited about Monique and Matt having a, a youngster. So we want, we'd love to be out there for that and, um, and continue the rebuilding as well. You know, uh, we, we certainly rebuilding in Dubai and Robbie and Matt are building there and they need support. They've got to, it's a three to five year deal when you start um, rebuilding and you're, you know, you've got to buy horses for at least three years and, and then they start to, to come through the four-year-olds, the three-year-olds, the two-year-olds. So we want to continue. We've supported them a little bit. Uh, last year, we bought it both Inglis and Magic Millions, uh, myself and a few of my clients, and we'd like to continue doing the same thing again. So I'd like to be there at least for, for one bunch of sales in February. Yeah, and, and I guess that's understated, Robbie, the rebuilding phase. It's, it's actually, it's not just a matter of, and I'll bring that up there. You can see you guys buying on the left and Matt celebrating on the right, but mm -hmm. it doesn't just happen like that. The horses that are running well now uh, have had to be in the system for at least a year sort of thing. And the horses we bought this year, they're just starting to run now. So it, it does take time, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. It's not something that happens overnight. As Mike said, it's a, it's a three to five year process. And, uh, you know, people take it for granted how long it takes to, sow the seeds to, to make the harvest and there's a lot of work that goes in and, uh, and then you need a lot of patience to develop the products to for them to be successful and it's so important to be uh, to be patient to make sure that you look after those horses so that they can develop and uh, and it's so important to do the grand groundwork to to buy the right horses you know so and some of the horses that we're buying, we're, we're being diverse um, to also buy horses that can run a trip as well. Because as Mike said earlier, that in Australia, we really specialise from the 1,000 to 1,600. So it's very easy to get yourself locked up into that category. And yes, we need to deal in that category, but we've also tried to buy a lot of horses there that will win in the distance ranges as well so that we can be diverse for our stable. So those horses will need a little bit extra time to develop. So you, to do that, you have to, you won't have as many runners as well if you're going to be looking after those ones. So you've got to allow for a little bit extra time for that, for that part of the business to grow. Yeah. And it is a public webinar, so I won't give away all the trade secrets, but I've spent hours and hours uh, with spreadsheets and doing data analysis to find out the areas and races that are for big prize money that we think we can target at a lower price for our clients and also doing a few statistics on which races are, you know, what, what gives you the best chance to win, win group ones um, over historically over the last 10 years. So uh, we've got a lot of that data and we're putting that into play at the sales, but that's probably not something to mention on the webinar because we don't want our competitors following that. Uh, obviously, so Mike, it has been 12 months nearly that Matthew, that Griffith Racing became Griffith to Cock Racing. How would you assess Matt's first year training down here in Australia? I think it's gone pretty well. You know, um, they've had a fair amount of winners and, you know, they're dealing with, um, which is probably um, an oldish string, you know, of the horses that are, are running. Uh, I think it, the first partnership horses were bought last year, um, or sorry, not last year, the beginning of the year at the sales. Um, so, you know, nothing much has happened with them yet and quite understandable. Um, but I think the, you know, at first it was an, it was an honor for Matt to be, to be, uh, offered the partnership by Ro Robbie and it was a recognition on, on uh, Robbie's side on what Matthew can bring to the table. You know, he's, he's seen quite a lot around the world, but um, I've been impressed the way, the, long, the way they've gone about things. Um, you know, sometimes 
certainly social media and two-year-old racing has made a lot of us and owners very impatient. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, when you're rebuilding a stable, yes, you've got to have your two-year-olds. And yes, you know, there's slippers and blue diamonds and, and what do you that everyone wants to run in. But there's also very, very lucrative classic racing that you have there. That, you know, I mean, you just look at your, your last weekend and derbies and it's a lot of money. So um, I think the stable is gearing itself to be competitive from the early two-year-olds and a lot of the horses, certainly myself and my South African clients, we prefer to, to look at the classics and buy those classic type horses. And, you know, we, we have to be very patient. You know, as I said to you, sometimes when you buy a horse from an owner and say, look, I think it's a derby type horse, so we're going to have to wait until it's three. Uh, you know, you can imagine something going on and I will, you know, I actually want to buy a, a blue diamond or a slip horse. But, you know, only, only one horse can win the diamond and one horse can win the slipper. Um, you know, you've got to think. And you just look at your greatest race uh, in Australia is, is over two miles. You know, that's for a lot of money. So, you know, I like the thinking and, I, and I'm pretty sure that's the way, you know, both Robbie and Matthew are thinking. And Matthew comes from a background of a stable that is well known for preparing horses over, over a trip, you know. Yep. So I, I'm, I'm very impressed with the way they've gone. And I think it's, they've built a good platform to expand on. Yeah. And I guess that, that leads me into the next question, just about rebuilding. You've obviously set up yards all around the world and, and every yard that you've set up would take a certain element of rebuilding. So I, I guess from the outside looking in, in a rebuilding phase, are you surprised at the success they've had already? Yes. You know, um, and the amount of support they got, I was very impressed. That, that for me was um, uh, the most impressive of all is that people, you know, backed this, this partnership and are still backing it. And they've produced uh, the goods with a, a limited amount of horses of ability. I mean, a horse like um, that ran on the wing, I think it was King, King Magnus. He's almost running, he's punching way above his weight, you know, running in races like that. So, um, you know, imagine if they... They could get the, the the group one horses that arrive, you know, from other countries or from other trainers or or are bought with the sales. Um, you know, if they can do that with horses that are punching above their weights, what's the potential, you know, when they get the real good ones? So, you know, it's a partnership that needs needs backing, it needs loyal ownership, it needs people to see the the future as they do, um, and and give it a and give it a chance. And but I, you know, just the, their first support, without really getting going yet, um, was very impressive, and 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 it just and you know I think it's uh, it's testament to what the people believe the partnership can do. Yeah, and I think being in being uh, obviously I work for Robbie and that, but being involved in a stable like I I'm excited each day. Every time we have runners, I think we just you can see the progress within. Uh, Robbie, just just on that, obviously speaking of getting the good ones, as Mike said. We've got a lot of good ones that are two-year-olds at the moment that are coming through, and we've actually got a couple running this week. Yeah, we have. We've got uh, we've got a beautiful Shalar Colt tomorrow. As you know, you've got shares in him. Um, you know, he, he's. It's always hard to assess how the two-year-olds will go down the down the straight for the first time. A um, little bit of an unfair advantage when you go to uh, Flemington and the Flemington home track horses have that up a hand on you and we don't get the chance to take him there, which is always a bit of a frustration. But he's uh, he's always been a forward going horse that Matt and I have always been impressed with what we've seen of him. He's always a horse to take a step forward. He never takes a backward step. And he's drawn wider, which is in, which is uh, pleasing because, you know, he's used to having horses on his left uh, rather than uh, the other way around going to Flemington. So I think that'll be a plus for him we think that he'll handle himself well. So we'd like to think that he'll give us a good sight tomorrow. Same applies with the filly on Thursday. Two fillies are in, one's only a little tacker, but she's a get up and go filly. Uh, her mum was a good race mare that we trained, um, Deja Blue, and she, you know, she's a Caravaggio filly. She gets up and has a dip. And the other girl um, also by Shalar that Matt and I bought in Melbourne, she's had a bit more of a classic mare that ran fourth in an Oaks, but. She's another girl that has never put a foot wrong. She's actually worked a lot um, with the Colt and, um, you know, she trialed quite well recently. 
and um, she's always put a foot put put a foot forward as well, and given us the opinion that um, she'll give us a good side and she'll improve a lot over ground. What are your thoughts? Oh, I've lost you there, Robbie. I think he said, what are your thoughts, Matt? So we might cross to you. Yeah, it's, it's exciting um, tomorrow and Thursday because it's the first two olds that are running from the sales that we bought at the beginning of the year. So um, it just shows you that we bought 55 yearlings and in the space of a week, you know, it's just two of them were running that we, that we bought. So uh, it's part of the process. And, and these are two of the early ones and hopefully they can show us something during the week. Yeah, and we also, with the homebreds, Robbie, the uh, Fiorente filly jumped out really nicely today. And she's actually a staying a staying filly. And she, she jumped out over 800 metres today and actually won the won the jump out. Yeah, Matt and I have been really impressed with her sectional speed because, uh, as you pointed out, um, she's a Fiorente filly being a cup winner. Um, he can... Put a bit of he can have good sectional speed for Rente because he did run really well in an all age stakes a year over 1400 and he won a fee in over a mile. And uh, she's out of a quite a fast Royal Academy mare, and so we thought the mating might work, and it, it obviously has. So we're going to pop her straight out and give her the spring out because she's got this good speed, but if she hasn't bodied up. And Matt and I are only saying this morning, once she bodies up, we think she's got a nice future. So We'll pop her in the paddock and the other filly that uh, Matt and I were commenting on this morning too, the, the Magnus filly out of the Galileo mare and uh, I forget her race name now, she just got named, but she went quite well this morning too. So we bought her in Melbourne. I think she was a quite a, a, a affordable buy. I think she was 50000 for the hammer when Matt and I bought her at Premier. But, um, you know, she's a, she's a nice filly also too. So we've got some nice ones there that we'll tuck away for the spring and they'll come back, you know, well-developed in the autumn. Yeah, and Matt, we've got a few other runners on Thursday on Oaks Day as well. Yeah, Corey, we have um, Hal Vorsen. He's making a comeback um, after having a little holiday. He seems to have freshened up very well. Um, his work's been impressive. Uh, we changed one or two things, you know, with his footwear and, and uh, things like that. So hopefully that uh, can spring some life into him. And then we have Hasseltoff. Uh, he was a little bit disappointing in his last start, but I think he's back to his right distance now. Uh, so we expect a better run from him. And we might move into some questioning here. Uh, actually, oh, actually, we'll speak about new ones, Robbie. We, we've been pretty active. We bought a really nice Australia Colt at the yearling sales at Tattersall. So we might start with just chatting about him. Yeah, well, he was a, he was a ripper buy. Um, you know, Australia is a champion young stallion and um, beautiful classic bred. Colt and um, out of a half sister to rekindling that won the cup. We're talking about the cup tomorrow, so we're very excited to get a classic horse like that into the stable. Exactly what Mike was talking about earlier, you know, um, getting a, a quality horse like that to come down to Australia um, to develop would be uh, absolutely ideal. And um, you know, so they're the sort of pedigrees you want to uh, get into the stable, and he could come down and be like, you know, horse like Russian Camelot that won some derbies and and develop into a, a cup horse and win our, win our Holy Grail, you know. He's got the pedigree to do it. And then the one on the screen there is uh, one we just bought uh, recently at the Breeze Ups in Sydney, and uh, he's got a beautiful pedigree too, you know, Toronado out of some really nice uh, bloodlines there on the on the female side with the, Going back to a derby winner on his third down from New Zealand with uh, some really good Danehill blood and uh, and so on, which w marries up really well with Toronado. And he he's a stand that's really doing well, Toronado. So that high chaparral blood in Australia is just going from strength to strength. So he didn't know what he was doing November the 8th foal and breezed up. He was going from left to right, running to the running rail and didn't seem to know much about the caper, but had a beautiful stride and still ran fast time. So... Matt and I are just going to give him the spring out and let him develop, and uh, he'll come back a beautiful horse in the autumn. Yeah, and being a Toronado, Matt, obviously you've got Mask Crusader who's flying as a sprinter, but what what sort of distance would you imagine this this boy would get over? Well, you'd imagine he'd be pretty versatile. He's, he's shown in his breeze up that he's got speed, and then on his, in his pedigree that he's got a bit of stamina on his um, dam side. So you'd be hopeful that he'll get up to a mile, and uh, if he does happen to get further, there'll be a bonus. Yeah, and you can see there, guys, that the shares start there, 
uh, down the bottom, 6,581. Uh, and he, there is around 30% of him left. So uh, he got snapped up pretty quickly. We haven't pushed him too much because I think it's a no-brainer that he'll, for 105,000, he was pretty good buying. We only had two horses on our shortlist from that whole catalogue and we managed to get one of them and the other one went for over 400,000. So we sat that one out. Uh, so ne next thing, I might answer some of the questions that we have coming in now, Robbie. Uh, and I'll go to you, Mike. So I'll answer some of these and I'll read them as we're going. What's what's the Group 1 prize money like in South Africa and how does it compare to here? Well, <laughs> it doesn't compare to there. Um, uh, Saturday, we had a, a big Group 2 year that was 800,000 Rand. It was $80,000 the summer. Cup, which comes up at the end of November, is I'll tell you now. I think it's about it's about two million. Let me just check. Um, which is two hundred thousand uh, dollars. No, it's one million. Sorry, it's hundred thousand dollars. At the moment, I think our biggest is probably two hundred thousand dollars. So, I mean, we've obviously had really hard times when the racing uh, operator collapsed here. And Mary Slack stepped up and bailed them out. Um, the prize money used to be a lot better, but it is um, it's not good, uh, you know, for 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 the quality of horses that run in them. But we we're in, again racing yeah, is in a massive uh, rebuilding stage um, after the collapse of the race operator. Um, so hopefully, you know, that that can only be onwards and up um, in the future. You know, it's more. I think racing is also. It's an economic thing in South Africa. It's not just that everyone's lost faith in racing. And as I said to you, we've gone. Through, we are going through a massive rebuild. Uh, yeah, in South Africa, it's going to be another three or four years before we hopefully get back to the our former glory days. Yeah. And Will Friedman's just asking, what's what's Mike's golf handicap now? <laughs> Will Friedman should talk. A man that arrived in Dubai told me he was a seventeen or eighteen. Then the, the more I got to know him, I realized that he was a four and a five before. Lovely baby, Will Friedman is. But anyway, <laughs> I'm an index, an index four at the moment. And ask Will Friedman if he's put in a score since he last played in Dubai with me about two years ago. He probably hasn't. I'll let you comment there, there Will, if you're, if you're watching. So, uh, And then Harry Williams just says, you've mentioned the time and challenges. Hard. Getting, getting the horses from South Africa to via the UK to Australia. What's the time and challenge for us to send horses to South Africa or Dubai the opposite way? Dubai, very simple for you. Um, I think you do a pre-embarkation quarantine. I know David Hayes used to send a few for the carnival for Sheikh Hamdan, and it was pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm going to say you do a pre-embarkation there of about two weeks and then you come into Dubai where you can do one of two things, either stay in quarantine, train out of there and then go straight back home or uh, go on a permanent papers and become a permanent export, which then would mean you'd have to be a quarantine before you went back to Australia, that's all. But it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, there is protocol between um, Dubai and um, Australia. Yeah, yeah, and Will said he hasn't played since. Oh, he's working too hard, Will. We'll have a moment silence for him. <laughs> <laughs> and here's one from Matt. So this is from Chris Santos. He says, what's the biggest difference that you've seen between South African and Australian racing? And secondly, pace-wise, are races run at a quicker pace in South Africa? Yeah, the biggest difference is, is probably the following of racing here. You just everyone watches racing, um, you know, everyone supports it. And it's a passion of a lot of people. Gambling in general is massive in Australia. And I think that's what makes racing so successful. Um, with regards to the pace, I guess it's, it's hard to, to generalize because the, the difference with Australian racing and South African racing is that Australia has so many different racetracks with so many different layouts and jockeys ride so differently on each and every track and they suit different horses, front runners, back markers, uh, whereas South Africa, we're very limited in our race courses and there's kind of one style of racing each and every week. So I think the pace in Australia is very different from racetrack to racetrack, soft conditions to fast conditions, 
whereas South Africa, like I said, is, it's more general than what you, you, every Saturday you go to the race course, you know what you're going to get, basically. Yep. And here's one for Robbie. Um, so Harry Williams was asking whether it's appropriate to ask, but he's just wondering uh, about owner interest from South Africa and how the setup of the business works in terms of ownership, um, which I can probably help answer that, Robbie. But if you want to have a crack first and then I can no, go no, through. No. He's basically asking what the split is of owners from sort of overseas clients and Australian clients. Well, you're probably better than that than me. You, you do all the selling of the shares. Yeah, I can tell you, Harry, that we have around 30% of our new clients. So new clients that have never been with the stable previously, around 30% have been overseas and 70% have been Australian. Um, but as as Robbie, you'd be able to talk about, you've got a, an incredibly loyal following here already that have... Uh, and the owners that we've had for years have been exceptional in their support this this past 12 months, especially, and, and going on into the future. Yep. There you go. Happy with that answer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, we, we've always had a good client base that have supported us for a long time, and, uh, and they've been very excited about the new partnership, and they've really um, jumped in and um, supported us, like Mike said. So we've had... Uh, We've had quite a quite a loyal base for many many years, and uh, they've been really excited by the partnership, and they've jumped on board and jumped into all these young horses. So yeah, so I don't know how, how many. What was it, about twelve hundred in our database? Isn't there, Corey? Before the new interest jumped in, you know. Yeah, I downloaded our ownership database a couple of weeks ago just to go through and make personal phone calls. And I've started on calling our owners one by one. And I can tell you that I've got about a thousand calls still to make. So no, they've, been very, they've been very, very good. And Shrani and I have always been very, very appreciative of the loyal support we've had. So it's been fantastic. Thanks, guys. Yeah. And just with that, anyone that is following and anyone that would like to chat at any stage with Robbie, myself or Matt and talk about their own personal portfolio and how they might manage it, uh, we're in the process of going through that for everyone at the moment. But if anyone's particularly interested in talking about the best way to go, then they can always pick up the phone and talk to us and we can we can try and give advice there on what we think is the best way for you, for you to go forward. Uh, James Carter's just asking, Matt, given the prize money so bad in South Africa, as Mike mentioned, um, it, is it not time for you to offer him a spot as a traveling foreman? <laughs> uh, I don't think you'll cut the grade because you'll, you'll mostly just keep playing golf in, in the afternoons and probably not pitch up to work. So, no. Nah, there you nah. go. And, and uh, Kaj Hansen asks, how many horses do you have in your stable in South Africa? But even if you expand on that, how many do you have in each of the stables at the moment? I've got a we've got a hundred in training here at the moment, and uh, in Dubai I've got six with another three on the way. Yeah, uh, Will Reno says, are the preps generally longer for horses in South Africa or Australia? That might be one for you, Matt. Uh, definitely longer in South Africa. Um, we're not fortunate enough, like you are here in Australia, to have the facilities where you can send the horses down to the beach or water walkers or or things like that. We don't have access to that. So they stay in the stables a lot longer in South Africa. Yeah, and Robbie, I guess that's that's probably when you look at horses like King Magnus and don't tell the boss having such long preps with, with such good success, is that something that Matt's maybe brought across that you can keep these horses in training for longer if you, if you give them those little paddock rests in between? I definitely think that, you know, Mike and Matt's experience of traveling the world where you can't have access to the luxuries that we have in Australia to have that skill of being able to keep horses in training um, without having those luxuries, then you have them in Australia, enables you to keep horses in training a lot longer. And yes, it's been absolutely proven in our stable because King Magnus, don't tell the boss, a lot of those horses just had, don't tell the boss had 20 odd runs and held a form in every run, you know. And every time she went into the yard, the people, the, tele, the television people kept saying this horse looked better than the run before, you know. Um, King Magnus, the commentary, keeps saying, oh, he's got to have enough, surely, and he just keeps raising the bar. So I think that absolutely yes. I think that uh, Matt's experience travelling the world and 
Mike can vouch for that. Anyone that's had that global experience of uh, being able to do that is, is a massive plus. Here's a question actually that's from myself, but I'm sure other people would have it. A horse like King Magnus, for example, when he keeps getting better every run, how do you decide as a trainer when it is time to give him a break? Because the, the temptation must be to run him forever when he's just getting better and better and better and better. Um, probably in his case, it'll probably get down to um, uh, greed in many ways. You'll probably get to the stage where you'll say, you know, he's at that stage now where it'll be more beneficial to lose four rating points winning a, a high price race and a medium price race. So if he wins, say, a Cranbourne Cup worth 500000 you'll then, Matt and I will sit down and say, you know, we want to be a bit greedy and not win a off-season Flemington race worth 100 grand when we can win probably a $250,000 target race or a $300,000 target race or maybe a million-dollar target race in the autumn and you'll start letting greed for want of better expressions, maybe that's not the right word, but certainly maximise your income by targeting, you know, the $2 million race that he was in on, on, on Saturday. If you're going to, if you're going to lose rating points, you want to make it worthwhile. And now he's got the ability to do that. You know, you can always come back to the other, the other races, you know, and that'll probably be your deciding factor. You'll give him a rest in the off season and target your, your, your carnival races. Now he showed that he can rise to the occasion, you know, yeah. Um, Harry Williams has a question here for you, Mike. Why is it that South Africa don't have the facilities that Australia seem to have? And is there a continual learning from South Africa to improve those facilities and, and move towards those types of facilities? Yeah, those, the, the pre-training facilities you have, um, we have very few of at that sort of level. Um, and I mean, you make quite a big deal of it there, you know, uh, in and out of the stables. Um, whereas we tend to, like Matthew says, keep them in the yard all the time. Um, I've always been loath to rest, rest also at a peak. Um, for me, once they show you they want to rest when they run a bad one or start to niggle or go off the food a bit, then throw them out short. Um, but it's, uh, you know, look, it's probably just an economic thing. It's very tough to make money here or to pay the bills as a pre-trainer. Um, whereas I think there it's, it's, it's quite a good business. So, um, I mean, it's something we, we have definitely learned from the Australian method and are hoping to try and get going here. You know, I've always been of the opinion now that we've got this transition in racing that we, we need to really look at that because it costs a hell of a lot of money. Um, it, costs a, it costs a lot of money in training. And um, the pre-training system is a lot easier economically on the, on the owner's burden, but it also is very good, uh, you know, for the horse. And the pre-trainer has the ability also to, to make a successful uh, business. So it's something I like, but it's, it, it's, been, it's been difficult here. Just on, it's an economic thing, really. It's not that we, we don't want to do it. We... The trainers keep tend to keep the horses in the yards and keep them going, you know. Yeah. And I guess um, the next one here is from Pat Silby. Matt, this might be a good one for you. Um, I've noticed that a lot of overseas horses carry nose roll gear, whereas that doesn't seem to be common in Australia. Any reason for that? I think it's just each to their own, Corey. Um Back home in South Africa, uh, in my old man's yard, every single horse goes to the race for the first time with a nose roll. Uh, whereas here at uh, Griffiths to Clark Racing, it doesn't happen. Um, but it's just, I think it's just each trainer to their own, what they're lacking is, what they think their horse is like. And um, I, I think it's tre just a trend, you know? Yep. And the Magnus that trialed today, Harry's just asking, which Magnus was that, Matt? That's barefoot. Barefoot Toro is her name. Yeah, and she was picked up at the Melbourne Prem for, for 50000 I believe. Is that the, that the one? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and Robbie, just while we're talking about pre-training facilities, um, there might be a few uh, exciting developments, which I'm not actually sure if I'm able to mention, but I might just throw that to you and you mention what I'm, what I'm allowed to mention and what I'm not at this stage. 
Yeah, no, you absolutely can. Um, there's been a recent development that um, Sharani and I bought a farm, uh, 80 acres. Uh, it's an established farm. Uh, it's been very successful for many years, Cloverdale Logistment Property. And, um, and the main reason why we bought that was actually um, Matt and I, which Mike can understand this, um, we, when you continually um, put horses out for a little freshen, if you want to, you know, have a little gap between runs and you don't want to let, let them out of your yard because, you know, you don't want things to go wrong. And so that's a trainer's always worst fear. So we've been very fortunate that one of uh, Mike's good friends and Matt's good friends is a very, very good trainer, which we've had on the webinar before, Joey Ramson. And um, he's uh, here in Australia now. And uh, Joey was asked if he was interested in uh, – doing some freshen up work and some treadmill activity and everything like that on the, on the farm. And um, he jumped at that opportunity to do so. So that's something we're going to ramp up on that property because it's a very good property. It's uh, some champions have been there, Black Caviar and Co, some very big names. And um, so that's something that we think is a fantastic addition to, uh, to complement our stables. And it's just down the road, it's only minutes away and it's a, it's a beautiful property. So, I think it's a, a fantastic addition. Yeah, and that's an exclusive there, guys, because it's not been mentioned uh, until now, but we may have to actually do a proper um, a proper sort of announcement on that, Robbie, I'd say, in the coming months once it's all set up. Yeah, once it's all uh, up and going. I mean, the property itself has been well established for many years, and uh, as I said, that you know, some champions, uh, you know, graced, uh, graced there for, for – you know, many a time, you know, as I said, Black Caviar and Peter Moody and Mick Price and those guys have used it for, for quite some time. It's a, it's a fantastic facility, but there is room to um, to put some uh, extra facilities in. There's a beautiful arena there and uh, Joey's going to uh, put a treadmill in there and do some exercise there. But more importantly, uh, it's his, it's his uh, expertise that you, that you want to have on the property. The fact that he's trained 30 Group 1 winners and knows what trainers want. So any trainer that's using the uh, using the property, whether it's me and Matt or Mick Price or anyone that's there will, you know, will well and truly uh, have that benefit. So for us, for Matt and I, having a, a horse down there, having a freshen up, uh, it'll be just absolutely outstanding. And, you know, that's something that Mike will well and truly uh, appreciate as any trainer does, you know, when a horse needs a little freshen up, you can have them in the right, right, uh, the right hands and that's important. I often tell everyone that between the four of us and Joey, we've trained over 150 Group 1 winners. I, I don't mention the fact that I haven't trained any of those, but that's all right. Um, Mike, um, just qu quickly, obviously touching on Joey, an old rival of yours, but also an old friend of yours. Um, like You must be licking your lips at the idea of um, us as a stable having those sorts of facilities and options for our horses. Well, Joey brings a wealth of knowledge uh, to the table and a lot of expertise and he's trained at the highest level and frankly, a lot of Joey had a very high percentage um, stakes winners in South Africa. I mean, he won a lot of races, but, but a lot of them would have been stakes races. So, I mean, when it comes to dealing with a good horse, uh, Joey is, a, is, is an expert. That's for sure. Um, and apart from that, he's actually got a, a, a very good eye at the, at the sales. Uh, he was uh, it was a chap that always bought well here uh, at not the highest level. Um, he knew where to find a bargain, and um, yeah, he's he he brings a lot a lot to the table for sure for for Matt and Robbie that I can tell you now. And it's uh, you know um, especially you know training in South Africa, yeah, you know you're not as, as spoilt as you are. I mean things like um, it, treadmills have only been a, a recent in inverted commas, introduction into South African racing. It's something that I uh, saw in Singapore, uh, not Singapore, yeah, in Singapore and Malcolm Thwaites in Dubai and I got Alan Davy out here. I was the first one sort of that started treadmill. So, you know, and those things have been going for many years there with you. So, and, and Joey is um, well-versed in all these departments and getting horses ready. Um, he, he knows exactly what trainers want because you know, he's been there and, 
uh, he's going to be a um, a wonderful addition, in my opinion. And you know, he's got a wealth of knowledge that Robbie and Matt can tap into. As you know, as Matt as well has also got a wealth of knowledge that he's learned from here and traveling that Robbie can tap into. And you know, Robbie's got a wealth of knowledge um, from Australian racing that Matthew and 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 um, Joey will tap into. So. I believe that the partnership uh, will complement each other very well. Yeah, and Robbie, I guess the question people might ask about Joey coming on board is why would a trainer in his own right with 30 Group 1s want to come on and do pre-training for us? But it's obviously a lot of that's to do with his personal situation in terms of having a young uh, young family that he wants to spend his time with and trainers' hours aren't always uh, conducive to that. Exactly right. I mean, you know, sometimes when you've been there and done that and you've got a young family, you don't necessarily want to do that again. You know, he's, he's you know, as Mike said, he's trained at the, he's trained at the highest level and he's, he's won his, uh, he's won his uh, grand finals and he's, he's content with his uh, life and what he wants to do. And he's very excited about being involved in the business. And uh, he's been at the yielding sales with us. He was around every yielding sale and, uh, when we we're at the Gold Coast, uh, Joey and Peter Ford went one direction. Matt and I went the other. We met in the middle. Um, we bought some beautiful horses, and uh, as uh, Mike said, he's got a great eye, and uh, you know, so he's doing the yearling sales with us as well. So he was excited about that, and uh, yeah, he's very upbeat about it. So yeah, and he's got he doesn't have those early mornings like Matt and I do. So he's uh, he's quite happy about that as well. Yeah, he's also pretty fun to have around. So the team's starting to become quite a fun sort of team as well. And so once we start getting that flow of winners, it should be should be a, a decent sized party next Melbourne Cup, I'd say, when we start winning them. Um, Matt, uh, just another development within the team as well is I know that you guys purchased some new equipment um, with the data analysis that that you might want to touch on. Yeah, Corey. Um... I've been shopping around for a couple of months now and having worked, you know, with my dad in Dubai and uh, having access to a lot of this heart rate data and stride length um, and sectional timing devices. Uh, we've just been shopping around trying to find the right one. And uh, I think we found the right one in Ari, Ariana, Ariana. I'm not too sure on how you pronounce it, um, but it's it's been ordered and it's on its way. So we're looking forward to getting that out on the horses in the morning and uh, just capturing some of that, uh, that data that we can use as a tool in our, in our training. Um, very exciting. Yep. And we might uh, try and wrap up soon, but Robbie, just a quick one. Uh, so we've got the Toronado Colt, but the other horses in training sales, the ready to run sales are coming up magic millions and the New Zealand ready to run. So we'll be active at those sales. I would presume. Yeah, it's the same process again. We'll we'll go through like we did with Sydney. We zeroed in on once we we had about you know twelve horses that we zeroed in on, and then by the time we finally tuned it, we end up with two, and the two that we um, we bid on one was too much than we wanted to pay for, so we let that one go to Hong Kong for three hundred eighty thousand, whatever it was, and um, that was the deep field cult, and we bought the Toronado. So. We'll go through the same processes for uh, New Zealand. Matt was looking at a lot of them today and the same with the Gold Coast. And if we buy, great. And if we don't, that's okay too. So the most important thing is uh, getting value for our owners um, and getting the right horse for the yard. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Uh, and I guess what everybody that's watching will wrap up, but what everyone that's watching would hope is to hear what your best tip of the week is, Robbie, from our yard and also the Melbourne Cup winner. Oh, I might I might stick with the import for the Melbourne Cup and I don't mind Chris Waller's horse that won on Saturday. Which it's import? Great house down the, down the weights a bit. Which import are we going for? No, the one, what's his name? The good horse. The... Spanish Mission. Yeah, that's and, him. Yeah. Andrew, yeah. Andrew Balding's horse. Yeah. 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 yeah, I like him. It's interesting. Interesting to know, Corey, uh, Spanish missions owned by um, Gary Barber and his connections and uh, Gary yeah. Barber and Larry, Larry Nestat and uh, Lindsay Rolfs, all of them have, have joined our team. So there's some big clients, um, big clients from around the world that have uh, supported our yard. 
you stole my thunder there, Matt. That was my segue in with the Melbourne yeah. Cup tips. I was going to end with Spanish Mission when you guys tipped and centervised, but unfortunately, you beat me to it. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I think Spanish. He's a bloody good. He's a bloody good stayer, isn't he? Like he's 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 a terrific. Yeah, player. he went yeah, ahead. No, we're, all, we're all hoping you can go well. Yeah, um, Mike, what's the best for for your yard? That if we're having a punt over in South Africa, which which horse should we be backing over there this week? Oh, this week, I was going to say, you just stick with Desert Miracle, but you're not going to get rich. <laughs> um, now, we've, got a, we've, we've actually got some uh, interesting runners on Tuesday in Motown Magic, definitely maybe keeping the peace. Uh, they should all, they all uh, look like to have uh, each way chances. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we're sort of in a rich vein of form at the moment, so... Um, it's been going pretty well. But I, I just wanted to say as well, Corey, um, just about the, the guys and, and and the owners. And and um, I think owners have got to realise and, and, and keep being open-minded that good horses come from anywhere. You know, if you bought them from Europe, Australia, South Africa, wherever, everyone does have their something to bring to the table. And uh, you've got to be pretty open-minded about where you buy, buy horses. You know, don't just stick to one sale or one country or one specific type of horse and I think um, this is what Robbie and, and Matthew have, have got and I think Joey will help them with as well. I mean we've even had we've even got fillies out from America uh, by Arrogate there which probably be yep. the only Arrogates you'll, you'll see in Australia but yep. I, I think that's where uh, you know Robbie and Matthew have got this broad minded view about building the stable that it's going to be built up with horses from everywhere you know and clients from everywhere yeah, and I guess King Magnus is a good uh, example of that, Robbie. So didn't exactly wasn't exactly thrown in our faces. This guy will be a champion. He was this scrawny little um, three year old, and now he's a champ. Exactly right. So and uh, incentivizes another one to Woomba Maiden in March, and now he's the the shortest price favourite for the Melbourne Cup since. Farlap, I think. So they can certainly come from, from anywhere. So the dream lives on. Uh, I think we've got a few in the stable that will come not from nowhere, come from the sales this year. So should be good. Uh, thanks, Mike, for joining us. I really appreciate it. I'm sure all of our viewers appreciate that as well. Uh, Matt and Robbie, thanks. Pleasure. And, Thank you. And obviously, you, I'm you away ready now. For the wedding? You ready for the wedding on Sunday? On Saturday, Corey? Saturday. I don't think you're ever ready, but I'm as ready as I will ever be. Um, but I think, yeah, so I'm away now until the 22nd of November. So hopefully the, the strike rate can continue without me. Uh, I, know I, I led two horses in the yard the other day. So I think that's probably why, why we had success uh, on, on Derby Day. But no, all jokes aside, uh, if anyone needs to contact uh, myself, then my emails and everything are still working, but I'll be watch, uh, looking at them fairly sparingly while I'm away. Uh, and Monique, uh, Matt's partner, who's in the office, if, if you need anything, just contact the office or email admin at griffithracing.com.au and Monique will help you out while I'm on break. Um, but yeah, that's the last webinar for now until, until I return. So thanks, guys. Um, yeah, it was another good one. So we started with you, Mike, and we've go off to a little break now and hopefully win, win a few races on Thursday. Thanks very much. Yeah. It'd be nice to continue the strike rate. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank Good Thanks, night. Mike. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. See ya. Bye. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Mike.